have a wonderful speaker who will be giving you a very inspiring and intellectual journey. So please hold on to your seats. I want to thank all the Evergreen Valley staff, faculty, and students for making this event possible. Our speaker. Now first, when they asked me to introduce a speaker, I was hoping it'd be an easy subject matter, but I really have to pronounce these words, so I was hoping it'd be an easy subject matter. But no, Dr. Natalie Bataya is an astrophysicist at the Space Science Division of NASA Ames Research Center and Kepler Mission Scientist. Dr. Bataya started her career as a stellar spectroscopist studying young sunlight stars. She holds a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of California, Berkeley, a doctorate in astrophysics from UC Santa Cruz, and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in Rio de Janeiro. That is exciting. Inspired by a growing number of exoplanet discoveries, she joined the team led by William Barocchi at NASA Ames Research Center, Moffett Field, California, working on the transit photometry and emerging technology for finding exoplanets. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce our speaker, Dr. Natalie Bataya. Good. Okay, um, thanks for coming. A couple of caveats before we start. We've got a somewhat precarious cable situation going on. So if all of our planets turn purple all of a sudden, you know why, don't him. Um, I'm here to talk uh, about the search for evidence of life beyond Earth, or really beyond the solar system. And so the title of this talk is A Planet for Goldilocks. Because we've spent about the last, well, my whole career really, the last 16 years, designing an experiment that would find what we consider to be just right planets. Planets that are just right for life as we know it. So I want to tell you about that search and what we have found. That will be the first part of the talk. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the future. Now that we know what we know, what's next? Uh, because I think it's very exciting. We are on the verge of being able to find evidence, hard evidence of life beyond the solar system if it's out there. Um, might not happen in my lifetime, but certainly I expect it to happen in my children's lifetime. Um, and so I think that this is a tremendously exciting time. This is a question that human beings have had uh, well since human beings looked up at the sky and wondered what was there. Okay? All right, so a planet for Goldilocks. Uh, there are really three ways, pathways, for finding evidence of life beyond Earth. Uh, one is symbolized here on the left with a picture of one of the moons of the giant planets in the outer solar system. I think this one is Enceladus, orbiting uh, Saturn. And like, well, Enceladus and others like, like Europa, um, these icy moons of the outer planets we've observed have geysers emanating from the surface that's indicative of liquid water <coughs> underneath an ice shell. Several miles thick, an ice shell, it looks like uh, the material underneath is being heated, probably geologically, creating liquid water, and there is high, surf high pressure points, just like on Earth, where that water erupts these geysers. And that's exciting to us because we think that wherever there might be liquid water in the universe, there might be life. Because every life form on Earth, no matter how diverse or weird it is, no matter where it is on the tree of life, it's carbon-based. And carbon-based chemistry, as we understand it, requires liquid water as the solvent that's necessary for life-bearing processes, like metabolism. So we are looking for places where liquid water might be able to pool, where there is interesting mineralogy so that you can have complex molecular chains build up to create the complexity that we know as life. And so there are such niches in the solar system. Um, and so we might think about exploring those places. A second pathway is depicted with the image on the right. These are uh, radio telescopes up in Northern California near Mount Lassen. It's the Allen Telescope Array. 
that is scanning the skies in, at radio wavelengths looking for signals that cannot be explained by astrophysics, by, by physical processes from astronomical objects that we know about already. Right? These are SETI searches, if you've heard of that. There was a recent um, Silicon Valley mogul who invested a lot of money into SETI searches, Yuri Milner, uh, that, and that happened, I think, last summer, last, last fall, I think it was. But I'm here to talk about the third pathway that has really only opened up in the last 20 years since the discovery of the first planet orbiting another star. So that discovery uh, happened in 1995. I was a graduate student at the time, and it was announced at a conference in Florence, Italy. This is an artist's rendering of that planet. Uh, we don't actually have beautiful pictures of planets orbiting other stars because they are very, very far away and we can't resolve them or collect enough photons, although I'll tell you about how we're going to do that in the future. Uh, the existence of most planets that we know about orbiting other stars in the galaxy is inferred by some indirect means, some observation that we made of the star itself that infers the existence of a planet. This first one was a giant planet about the size of Jupiter orbiting a star kind of like the sun with an orbital period of about three days. That is, it made an entire journey around the star in just three days. That means, according to Kepler's laws of planetary motion that were laid out in the 1600s by Johannes Kepler, that means that this planet is extraordinarily close to its parent star, tens of times closer than Mercury is to our own sun. Okay? So this was the first planet discovery, and it was very unexpected. In our own solar system, you know, we, we thought we understood planet formation. This is kind of the lineup of planets in our own solar system, not necessarily to scale. Um, the sizes are, but not the orbits. But they are in the right order, from Mercury closest in to Uranus and Neptune closest out. And in our own solar system, right, you guys know this, we've got the rocky small stuff inside and we've got the big gas giants outside. So what the heck is a Jupiter-sized planet doing in an orbit tens of times closer than Mercury is to our sun, right? This was a great surprise to theorists. Uh, and I think that that will be a theme, you'll see. There have been many surprises. So this very first planet was exciting, and it really broke open the field, and a lot of investment started to pour in to do this kind of science more rigorously. Um, but really, if you're thinking about the search for life, that's not the obvious place that you want to look, right? Why is that? When we talk about Goldilocks planets, what exactly do we mean by these just right planets? So in this split screen diagram, what I'm showing are two properties, size and temperature. And these are really the two properties that we're most interested in right now for this kind of first cut look at what might be these Goldilocks planets. We care about size because from what we understand of planet formation, you cannot create a Jupiter-sized object that's all rock, okay? Primarily just because there's not enough raw materials available. When stars form out of giant molecular clouds we, that we see all over the galaxy, their composition, the, the kind of the recipe of, of elements that makes up a giant molecular cloud is mostly hydrogen, some helium, and just trace elements, trace quantities of all of the other elements. So there really just aren't enough raw materials to create something uh, that's rocky like Earth, but that's the size of a Jupiter. So size also matters. I mean, why, why do I have this fixation on rockiness? Well, I need rock because that's what complex molecules are made out of, right? Um, complex molecules are not built up necessarily out of just hydrogen and helium, which are the most abundant elements. We need carbon, right? We need silicon, we need nitrogen. We need all of these things that DNA are made up of, um, including hydrogen, but also these, these other more complex molecules. So in this giant planet, Jupiter here, there are there is thought to be a rocky core in the middle. 
But by the time you get all the way down to where the chemistry is interesting and the elements are, the elemental abundances are interesting, the pressures are so high that DNA is not going to be able to exist, right? So we don't want something too big. Likewise, we don't want something too small. A planet like Mars, for example, has such a low surface gravity that it has trouble holding onto an atmosphere. And if you lose your atmosphere, then you don't have enough surface pressure to keep water in a liquid state on the surface. Right? So we're really looking at a, at a narrow range of sizes that we're interested in. We're also interested in temperature. Because if you put a planet too close to the star, the water's going to all boil away. And if you put it too far away from the star, the water's going to freeze up and be, be uh, only available in a frozen <coughs> state. So now you don't have a solvent available, right? So we're looking at a narrow temperature range, or the way I like to think about it is maybe not temperature, but energy. How much energy is a planet receiving from the central star? You want to be at that just right distance. So we call that just right distance the habitable zone. It's a region of orbits where the existence of liquid water cooling on the surface is not forbidden. It can happen. There's potential for life. There's potential for liquid water. All right? So the habitable zone is the same idea as this Goldilocks zone. All right, so those are the planets that we want to find. This, this hot Jupiter that I told you about that was discovered in 1995 was discovered by a methodology called the Doppler method or radial velocity method. Mm. And this methodology makes use of the fact that yes, planets orbit their stars, right? But also, stars orbit their planets, okay? In fact, the planet and the star are in a mutual dance around their common center of mass. If you imagine a big, giant star, massive, and a tiny planet over here, and they're connected by a metal rod, and you have to balance them on your finger, you're going to put your finger very close to the star. That's the center of mass. That's the point about which they orbit. And so here on the right, this planetary system seen edge on, um, what's going to happen is this star orbits tightly around that center of mass, is it's going to have moments when it's moving slightly towards you, moments when it's moving slightly away from you, towards you and away from you. So if you catch the light from that star and you spread it out into a spectrum of colors, you can discern that, that wobble motion towards you and away from you in the colors, measuring the intensity of the colors, um, of every single color that's emitted by that star. So we infer the existence of the planet by its gravitational tug causing the star to sway back and forth. Okay? But this methodology did not have the sensitivity to find an Earth-Sun analog or a planet as small as Earth in the Goldilocks zone. So we had to think about different methodologies. Um, and we started thinking about the new methodologies in the 70s and 80s. And we wrote proposals to do a mission that utilized a method called transit photometry. The first proposal to NASA to utilize this method, which we, which we claimed had the sensitivity to be able to detect an Earth-sized planet, was put forward in 1992. It was rejected. 94, rejected. 96, rejected. 98 rejected. Finally, in the year 2000, it was selected. And that became the Kepler mission. Um, so the transit method, or what we call transit photometry, is very simple. What we do is we measure the brightnesses of stars. Simple. We don't actually see the star itself. We measure the brightness. But in some cases, when the planet and its orbit around the star is aligned just right, the planet is going to pass between the telescope and the disk of the star. And when it does so, it's going to block out a little bit of light. So what you see here in this cartoon is the brightness of the star as a function of time. And when the planet passes in front, it dims ever so slightly. How much it dims is proportional to the size of the planet that blocks out the light. So from this methodology, we can get the radius of the planet, the size. right? Um, and by 
continuing to observe these stars without blinking, you'll see at once every orbital period of the planet. And so you can time that, and you can get the, you can measure the orbital period. And as I said before, the orbital period is related to the distance between the planet and the star. That distance tells us whether or not it's in the Goldilocks zone. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Well, before I start this, let me say, make one more comment here. Um, this is a very simple experiment, but what makes it so technically challenging is the precision that's required to see this tiny change in brightness. It's about a part per 10,000. If I had 10,000 light bulbs and I took just one away, that's the change in brightness that we're talking about. Um, another way to think about this is to imagine a skyscraper in New York City, maybe 80 stories tall, and every window is lit up. Every window's open and lit up, right? And one person goes to the window and lowers the blinds by about a centimeter. That's the change in brightness that you have to be able to see. So it requires great stability, and that was the engineering challenge that we had to uh, overcome in order to make this happen. All right, so now I'm going to show you what Kepler has found. It's stared at about 150,000 stars over a period of four years without blinking, taking a measurement of all stars simultaneously once every 30 minutes, okay? Um, and so I'm going to show you what we have found by, um, with, a, with a scatter plot. So the scatter plot is going to be radi uh, radius of the planet on the y-axis and the orbital period on the x-axis. Remember, those are the two things that we measure. And so what I'm going to do is, is walk you through the discoveries before Kepler. So here is the diagram. It's ticking through years. It started in well, 1995, effectively, with that very first giant planet. Remember, radius and orbital period. Every point you see is a planet discovery. We've got the blue points that were, that were discoveries from this Doppler wobble method. And then some pink points started to show up around 2001. Uh, those are from the transit photometry method from ground-based telescopes. And now we get up to the current year. Well, I guess it's no longer the current year, but close. And so this is kind of a snapshot of every discovery that's been made except for the ones from the Kepler Space Telescope, okay? So you look at this diagram and you see some patterns. You see, well, there aren't that many small planets, first of all. 80%, more than 80% of the planets are larger than Neptune, as indicated by that horizontal line, right? Um, you also see that there's kind of a cluster of blue points up there at Jupiter sizes and long orbital periods. But there's another cluster of points also at Jupiter sizes over here, those pink points, right? That's those, those are those uh, hot Jupiters, like 51 Pegasus, which I showed you in the first slide, that first discovery. So this makes me think that maybe small planets are, are pretty rare, right? Well, now I'm going to add to this diagram the planets that Kepler has discovered by searching this one piece of the sky, about the size of my hand on the sky, for four years, 150,000 stars. <laughs> right? It's a dramatic improvement. Literally, the veil has been lifted from our eyes, this veil that was, that was blinding us to the small planets that populate our galaxy. Right? Now, with these discoveries, over 80% of the planets are smaller than Neptune, all right? Um, we still have some gaps over here. This is because we don't have sensitivity, so we still have some blinders that we have to deal with. But we have now enough discoveries to actually do something interesting. And this is why Kepler was funded, in fact. It's to answer a very simple question. What is the fraction of stars in the galaxy that harbor potentially habitable Earth-sized planets, right? Just what is the potentiality for life out there in the galaxy? How many are there in this Goldilocks zone that are about Earth-sized? So I'm going to tell you the answer to that question, but first I want to say a little bit about the diversity of planets that's represented in this diagram. So we're gonna plot it a little bit differently. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to count 
the number of planets in all of these different size bins, and I'm going to show it to you as a bar graph. All right, this is what it looks like. So I colored brown the bars that correspond to planets that I would guess would be kind of rocky like Earth. And I colored in blue the planets that are expected to be like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, things that have a gaseous envelope or ice envelope. What I think is really interesting about this particular graphic is the, li the literal gray area in between. The most common type of planet known to humanity right now is a kind of planet that we don't even have in our own solar system. These things between the terrestrial planets and the gas giants. Right? So we'll talk a little bit about that more maybe at the end. But um, you know, we've, we've done a little bit of work on that. We find planets that are kind of about the same size as Earth. This one, what we affectionately call beer belly Earth, is 1.7 times the radius of the Earth. But oddly, it has exactly the same mass. Which means if you divide mass divided by volume, that's density, right? So if we get the, the radius from, from the Kepler transit photometry, and then if we can get the mass from another methodology, we can compute the density and we find out that this is a very fluffy big thing. It has very low density. So this is just one example of the kinds of planets that are in this odd region where we have no such examples in our own solar system, unless, of course, you read about the potential planet nine in our solar system. <laughs> that would be in that gray area as well. All right. Um, some other surprises. Um, we found planets like this. Here it is. It will swing into the lower left. This is, planet is called Kepler-10b. There you go. It's only 1.4 times the size of the Earth, orbiting a star very much like our own sun, but it's orbiting 23 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our own solar system. So this star-facing side has an ocean. Okay? An entire hemisphere of this planet is covered in an ocean. But it is not an ocean of liquid water. It's an ocean of, of lava, of molten rock. Okay? Because that, temp that star-facing side of this planet has temperatures in excess of that required to melt not just rock, but iron on the surface. Okay? We call these lava worlds. And we know a lot about them because they're so close to their star, we can actually get a mass measurement. So this is actual data. This is data from the Kepler spacecraft that shows that tiny dimming of light. Every little white point you see here is a brightness measurement. Okay, and that tells us the radius of the planet. Over here we have a Doppler velocity curve from the radial velocity method. This tells us the mass. We get mass divided by volume. We know its density. So we know that it's rocky. We know its temperature because we understand the star very well. Um, so this is a whole new class of planets, these lava planets. Um, but we can be even more extreme. This planet, orbiting a star called KIP 12557548, that's its license plate, um, is even closer. And the temperatures there are so extreme that the rock is it's melting and disintegrating. Okay? It is literally disintegrating like a comet, um, a rocky planet. And we know this because the dimming of light is not nice and predictable like the cartoons and the data that you saw. The dimming of light has some funny asymmetry. So it, it comes down, the, the star dims, but then it doesn't shoot right back up when, this, when the planet stops passing. It, it lingers, and that's because of that extended tail of evaporated, disintegrated material that's passing behind it, trailing behind it. So we've got disintegrating planets. Um, we proved that George Lucas was right. Planets like Tatooine can orbit two stars, not one. These are called circumbinary planets. Um, so this is an artist's rendering of a planet called Kepler-16b. And you're looking up from the planet at the two stars that it orbits. So George just got their relative sizes wrong. <laughs> Um, but the K-type star, the redder star, uh, should be tinier than a yellow G-type star, which is the one up there. 
that would represent their relative sizes. So in, in these cases, these two stars are actually gravitationally bound. So they're orbiting one another. With a, in this case, a very short orbital period. So they're, they're, you've got not one star rising in the east, setting in the west, but two. And they're swapping places, right? Like a pas de deux in the sky. Um, how do we know this? Well, when we look at these brightness measurements, we see complexity. We see the, the light curve, or the brightness measurements, is up on the top. So it kind of goes along, and then you've got, boom, blue. See that blue drop? That's actually one star passing in front of the brighter star, the hotter star. And so periodically, you've got a blue dip, a blue dip. In between, you've got a tiny yellow one. That's when the other star swings around and passes in front of the cooler star. Right? So you've got blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow. Ah, oh, we missed one. Spacecraft was doing something funny. Blue, yellow, blue, yellow, and it continues. So those are the two stars. But then interspersed in between, we've got a red. We've got a green. Red and green. And here you see what those dimmings of light look like. And that's due to the planet that passes first in front of the hot star, but then in front of the cool star. And so this gives us a wealth of information for characterizing this system. We understand their masses, their sizes, um, their orbital periods, their temperatures, all of that. OK. Um, I'm going to skip that one. So this is another scatter plot, but we're plotting slightly different things. On the x-axis is the amount of energy that's being received by a planet from its host star. And stars have different temperatures, right? Some stars are cool and small. Some stars are big and bright and hot. And so if you're orbiting, if you happen to be orbiting a cool, dim star, well, you're going to have to cozy right up next to it to be able to get energy sufficient for the blue water, right? So the habitable zone, this Goldilocks zone, is really close in. Stars like our sun are more like the yellow one on top. So you, you get further away, right? But what I'm plotting on the x-axis is the amount of energy being received by the planet. And this green area shows what we consider the Goldilocks zone. And so it's different for different kinds of stars as represented on the y-axis. And that's because different stars emit different mixtures of photons. For example, these stars, these coolest, smallest stars, emit predominantly red photons, not so much blue. Right, compared to our sun. And it's the exact types of photons that are important, how they interact with the atmosphere and scatter and all of that, and then interact producing greenhouse um, warming is all important. Anyway, these are all of the points, all of the planets that Kepler has discovered in the Goldilocks zone that are smaller than about twice the size of Earth. So it's kind of an exoplanet hall of fame. Okay. These are the ones that are the most interesting. And there are about three dozen. One example, this is Kepler 452, 452b. Here's a split screen that compares 452b on the right to Earth on the left. The stars themselves in the middle there are very similar. They're both kind of G-type sun-like stars, about the same age. Um, Kepler 452b is about 10%, I'm oh, sorry, I don't know. I think it's about 60% larger, yeah, 1.6 times the size of the Earth. Um, but their orbital periods are very, very similar. So right now, at this point in time, this is the closest thing we have to an Earth 2.0. Is it Earth-like? Is it habitable? Is it truly a habitable environment and not just a habitable zone or Goldilocks zone planet? That we don't know. We have to do further characterization. Um, but it's a very intriguing planet discovery. All right, so we have all of these discoveries, and now I want to say something about statistics. Um, what is the fraction of stars that have planets? So. This diagram is a, an artist's rendering of the Milky Way galaxy, as if we could be above the Milky Way looking down. And the yellow cone that you see is Kepler's search space. This one kind of hand-sized uh, stamp on the sky, looking out 100 square degrees on the sky, looking out about 3,000 light years, 
That was the little cone of the galaxy that we are effectively taking a census of to ascertain how frequent planets are. Okay? So from that, you saw this kind of a diagram, this bar diagram, um, showing the numbers of discoveries in each of these size bins. But now I need to correct for observational biases, right? Because these giant planets are actually really easy to see. Those small Earth-sized planets are really hard to see. So I have to correct for that in order to understand the statistics. Um, I have to correct for the fact that for every one of these systems that we saw, because their orbits were just aligned just right, so that the shadow of the planet swept across the face of your telescope, for every one of them, there's like 10 to 200 others that had a different orientation. I have to correct for that, okay? So I make those kinds of corrections, and so instead of pl uh, plotting the fraction of discoveries that I've observed, I'm going to now plot the average number of planets per star, a true population measure. And now the histogram ends up looking something like that. So we went from this to what we observe to this, which is, represents the population that's truly out there. And so what we've learned from this is that at least within like an Earth orbit and inward, in this part of these planetary systems that we consider to be the realm of the terrestrial planets, right? Certainly it is true that the smallest planets are the, the emperors of the domain, okay? They're the most common. Yes, giant planets can exist in these inner regions of a planetary system, but they are relatively rare. The reason that our first surveys were picking them up and not the Earth-sized planets is simply because those are the easiest ones to find. All right, so now I want to give you a sense of how frequent the Goldilocks planets are. So this was all planets, right? Of all orbital periods, Goldilocks are not. Now I want to focus on the Goldilocks planets that are earth size. And so for this, we're going to do a thought experiment. We're going to consider the Milky Way galaxy. And then we're going to shrink the continental United States down to the size of the Milky Way, OK? So we're over here in California, and we were here kind of near the Pacific Ocean, right? And we are going to stand here at Evergreen Valley College, and we're going to face our bodies east, and we're going to look across the continental United States, and we're going to ask ourselves the question, where is the next nearest potentially habitable Earth-sized planet? Okay? In which state would it reside? And the answer turns out to be, Uh, just up the hill by the Montgomery Trail. <laughs> About a quarter of a mile away. Okay, in these Milky Way, in this Milky Way model. Okay, that translates to about about seven light years. Okay, it's within about seven light years. It's very nearby. That changes our perspective. Like, holy cow, the galaxy is littered with these planets. Right. And that makes the pursuit of finding evidence of life beyond the solar system so much more compelling. It turns out that about uh, the average number of these kinds of planets per star is about 0.25. Okay? So a pretty high number. All right. So that's what we've accomplished so far. In the last 20 years, we've gone from a giant Jupiter-sized planet orbiting with a three-day orbital period to a planet like Kepler-452b, which is the closest thing we have right now to an Earth 2.0. And we know that these planets are relatively common. So what's next? Um, let's go back to this diagram. Can you see the little tiny red dot in the crosshairs mm -hmm. of that circle? Yeah. That's the, that's the volume I'm really interested in, OK? Um, here is a three-dimensional representation of every single star that we know of that's in that dot. There are about 300. We okay, have about 250 star systems, about 300 stars total. They have different temperatures and sizes. 
The red dots are those cool, what we call M-type stars. The yellow dots are the sun-like stars, the G-type stars. Um, and this has a radius of about 30 light years. Okay? So the nearest potentially habitable planet is in a circle that's about the size of this inner circle, right? It's, it's, just, it's just seven, less than, less than 10 light years away. So what we want to do next, now that we know how many planets there are in this volume, we want to design an experiment to find all of the nearest potentially habitable planets, and we want to characterize their atmospheres. We want to look at what the chemical composition is of their atmospheres, because life has such a dramatic impact on a planet's biosphere, on its atmosphere, right? Life on Earth has drastically altered the chemistry of our own atmosphere. If you were to look at Earth from a distance and look at its atmosphere and compare it to the atmospheres of the other solar system planets, you would know that's a living world, right? So we want to find these nearby systems so that we can, so that we can look at these chemical fingerprints of the atmosphere and we can try and pick out which are the living worlds and know that something's going on. All right, so NASA has a uh, kind of a 30-year roadmap for doing that. Right now, the present, Kepler is just, just now finishing. Next on the horizon, like within the next year or two, we've got JWST and TESS. Um, but what I want to talk about now is this kind of hypothetical thing right here that I'm calling the New World's Telescope. This is what's next on the horizon that we're studying right now. If we get this planned and we do it right and we get our funding, we could start to build this observatory sometime around 2025, which is when money will be liberated from these other missions that are already kind of in the pipe. So what this New World's Telescope is, is a direct imaging telescope. Up until now, everything you've seen has been an artist's rendering. What we imagine a planet to be, to be like, based on its properties. Based on a lot of information, but still, we don't actually see pixels. We don't resolve their surfaces. Um, what we want to do next is actually collect light from the planet itself. Not just infer the existence of the planet from the star, no. We want to collect photons from the planet, bouncing off that surface. That's the only way that we're going to be able to discern something about its atmosphere. All right? So that's the aim. We're going to do this with direct imaging. So let's think about that a little bit. Here what I've got is a representation, a simulation, of what the Earth would look like if you observed it with the Hubble Space Telescope, our greatest space telescope, the Hubble, um, from Mars which is about a half of the astronomical unit away. So it looks kind of fuzzy, right? We lose resolution, but we can still make out surface features. This is what Earth would look like from about 20 astronomical units, around the orbit of Uranus, okay? We keep going, 200 astronomical units. Voyager 1 is out at 134. Now you see that we've it's gotten so faint, so far away, even the Hubble Space Telescope has very, very few resolution pixels across the surface of that planet, okay? So we're not gonna be able to resolve features, and this is just from the outer solar system, but we can still get light from the planet, okay? Well, we keep going. This is what it looks like from 20,000 astronomical units. That's almost out at the next star, Alpha Centauri. And this is what it looks like at Alpha Centauri. Okay, why did it change so dramatically? Just, I just went a factor of 10 in distance. Why did it change so dramatically? Because that tiny little planet, which is Earth, reflecting this tiny little amount of radiation from the star, is now lost in the glare of Alpha Centauri itself, right? Um, so, so uh, I'm sorry, of our sun. So imagine you're on Alpha Centauri and you're looking back at the solar system. 
now the earth is there, but this is the sun. Okay, it's the earth is lost in the glare of the star. Um, so that's because the star itself is 10 billion times brighter than the amount of light that's being reflected off the surface of the planet. Um, and it's separated by this very, very tiny degree of, of separation. And that's the closest star. That's just like four light years away, right? OK, so it's literally like trying to observe a firefly you know, next to a searchlight. This is the technical challenge ahead of us. Um, so what I want to do now is play a video for you. I hope that the volume is OK. Um, this video is going to explain the technology that's required to accomplish this. star is orbited by two planets. One looks similar to the Earth, the other is a gas giant. When viewed from a distance, the two planets disappear into the glare of their sun. How could we ever find these planets all the way from the Earth? By using a space telescope with a coronagraph to separate starlight from planet light. As the star's light passes through the telescope's large mirrors, it picks up small distortions. Diffraction adds concentric rings to the image we see. To reveal the planets, first a chronograph uses a mask to block much of the star's light and redirect the remaining light to the outer edges. A washer-shaped device can now block most of the rest of the star's light. Because the planet's light comes in at an angle, it misses the... We have to somehow suppress the light of the central star, right? So what we want to do, I mean, I, I'm blinded by these lights on the stage, right? If I'm trying to see a tiny firefly there or something behind it, what, what are you going to do? You're going you're to block it with your thumb, right? Just like if you go out and you want to see the stars at night, but you've got a big street light in front of your house, just hold up your hand and block the street light. Your pupils dilate, you can see what's behind, right? So that's what we're trying to do, and there's two ways to do that. Um, we can put a, a hardware, which is a thumb, inside the telescope to block the light. But of course, it has to be done very carefully because you're trying to see something right next to it. The other option is to put a thumb outside the telescope some tens of thousands of kilometers away, what we call a star shape. Make it very, very tiny because it's very, very far away, just enough to block out the star. So those are the two um, methods, and I'm just going to go ahead and start this over again, so now we'll be able to make more sense. This is the one inside the telescope. A distant star is orbited by two planets. One looks similar to the Earth, the other is a gas giant. When viewed from a distance, the two planets disappear into the glare of their sun. How could we ever find these planets all the way from the Earth? By using a space telescope with a coronagraph to separate starlight from planet light. As the star's light passes through the telescope's large mirrors, it picks up small distortions. Diffraction adds concentric rings to the image we see. To reveal the planets, first a chronograph uses a mask to block much of the star's light and redirect the remaining light to the outer edges. A washer-shaped device can now block most of the rest of the star's light. Because the planet's light comes in at an angle, it misses the mask and passes through the center of the washer. But when we turn up the image signal by collecting more light, we can see that the planets are still hidden under blobs of leftover starlight. To remove these blobs, the chronograph has a special deformable mirror that can change shape by using hundreds of tiny pistons. 
This can correct distortions in the light beam. As the mirror deforms, the blobs of light as seen in the monitor slowly begin disappearing, finally revealing the brighter of the two planets. Afterwards, the fainter planet also comes into view. We can now see objects more than a billion times fainter than the star. And if the light from these planets is passed through a prism, we can spread it out into rainbows of color. But some colors are missing. They were absorbed by gases in each planet's atmosphere, giving us important clues about their composition. The search for life in the universe has taken a new step forward. crazy as that, as that looks, as technically challenging as that looks, this has actually already been done from the ground, from ground-based telescopes for planets that are like 10 times as massive, as massive as Jupiter and much, much brighter and orbiting at great distances so that it's got a large separation. Um, so those kinds of contrast levels are not 10 billion to one, maybe 10,000 to 100,000 to one, um, but the basic principles are there. So the idea is to now put this technology into space using a telescope that is much larger than Hubble so that we can see, collect enough photons of the very, very tiny Earth-sized planets that are there. The second technology that's also being developed right now is called star shade technology. Um, this, is, this idea is to simply launch two pieces of hardware into space, a telescope and an unfolding star shade that looks like a sunflower in space. It has that special shape because of the properties of diffraction, because this light has to be suppressed so ever, ever so carefully. And if you fly it out far enough, it will be tiny enough that it will block out the pinpoint of light, but yet leave the glowing, reflected light from the planets behind so that we can collect their light and, and analyze it. Um, I think what I'd like to do now, um, I don't know how tight the organizers are on time, um, but we've got 10 minutes left of the hour and there's some telescopes that are opening up. I have lots of other cool slides I could show you, um, but I think what I'd rather do is kind of wrap it up and, and leave some time for questions um, so that we can talk a little bit. Uh, basically, uh, what we're trying to do now is plan for this big kind of 10 to 12 meter, I would say, telescope in space. Um, we can do things like measure the colors of planets. If you look at the solar system planets and you just see what color they are, Earth stands out. It is singularly unique in that it has nitrogen in its atmosphere, the way it does Rayleigh scattering, the way that it creates its blue sky, typically blue sky. Um, so we believe that if we can find a few dozen Earth-sized planets in the Goldilocks zone, we'll be able to make the transition between habitable zone planets to habitable environments and then to living worlds by understanding their atmospheres. So that's basically the progression that's being laid out right now. As I said, such a piece of hardware would start to be built in the mid-2020s, maybe launched by 2030 or thereabouts. So take care of your health. <laughs> so I'll just end, before asking for questions, I'll just end by saying that you know, for the first time, we are capable of answering this question, are we alone in the universe? Um, we know how to do it. We're not limited by technology. We're not limited by our knowledge. We're simply limited by resources, and those will come with time. Um, so it's a very exciting time, and I hope you stay tuned. Um, with that, I'd really like to open it up for questions. Yes. Me? Do we have? Yeah. Yes, we have a so my thinking is for it to be a habitable planet, you need a particular atmosphere. Yeah. Oh. So my thinking is, as I was listening to you speak, good presentation, by the way. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah. Maybe, I, maybe I missed something, but my thinking is for it to be a habitable atmosphere, you need a particular, you need a certain amount of gravity. So how do you measure gravity on these far-off planets? 
Okay, you're right. At the beginning, when we talked about what constitutes a Goldilocks world, we talked about size and temperature. And, and gravity, surface gravity is important. You know, Mars has a very low surface gravity and it doesn't hold on to an atmosphere, right? Very well. The atmosphere dissipates with time. Um, and so gravity is important. Now, the surface gravity of a planet actually can be measured if you know two properties, the mass and the radius. So, so the surface gravity is only related to those two properties. Kepler measures radius, mass we can get from Doppler. Um, with these brightness measurements of the future, I think we're going to be able to get the radius of the planet, or at least an estimate of the radius, because it's related to the brightness, how much light is being reflected. Um, but I also think that when we are able to collect light from the planets and spread it out into a spectrum so that we have all the different colors isolated, there are going to be features, little spectral fingerprints in that information that is also capable of yielding the surface gravity. So I have some hope that we'll be able to do that as well. All of these things are just kind of like little pieces. You know, you're like a detective just bringing in these little pieces of evidence to build a complete picture of the potential for habitability. Yeah. Hi there. Just one other question. So the Earth acts like a dynamo as well, and it creates the van, something else, you know, that, that, that help protect us, which is beyond the atmosphere. So for these planets, do they all have that? You know, the lava, let's say we find something that's very good spectral comparison to Earth. Yeah. But how do we know that it's got that magnetic piece? That, that's Seems a like great important. question. So, so um, there are people, there's a great book called The Rare Earth, which actually gives a huge laundry list. It kind of goes from the philosophical perspective that, gosh, you had to have so many different coincidences align in order for life to be able to thrive on Earth. One of those being a magnetic field to protect you. Oh, goodness, I can no longer see the audience. Um, okay, Do you need a um, let's see, Yolanda, I think I saw you. If you yeah. have asked somebody to turn down the lights just a little bit. A magnetic field, right? Magnetic fields are probably important because they shield us from the charged particles that are in the solar wind that bombard the Earth constantly that would be detrimental to our life. It was like, damage our DNA, cause mutations, create cancer, all these terrible things, right? Magnetic fields is one. Plate tectonics. Plate tectonics leads to the carbon cycle on Earth. You know, it regulates the temperature of Earth. Also thought to be very important. Um, the existence of a moon is thought to be important in stabilizing the Earth's spin axis. The existence of Jupiter out there shielding us from all of these asteroids and other debris that's coming into the solar system. You know, all of these things could be very important. We just don't know. What I think is that we're going to go out, we're going to look at these spectral fingerprints of the atmospheres of lots of Goldilocks planets. And I think that there are certain planets that are going to stick out like a sore thumb because something's going on. Those are going to be the ones that we're going to want to look at very carefully. And I mean, my point is that a transition from a habitable environment to a living world is a huge transition. It has the potential to transform the planet completely. So with the current um, measurements, you're saying that the mass is determined by the Doppler effect, right? Uh, there are other ways as well. Because oh, I was wondering, wouldn't yeah. you account for potentially moons? Like also, when you're going that far, uh, you're saying, OK, the Doppler effect is this. We're inferring this much mass, but how much of that is the actual planet maybe versus the cumulative mass of the planet and the moon together? OK, that's a really good question. Let me restate it. So we say, well, OK, this Doppler method. Let's go back to this Doppler method. You've got these, the star and the planet, and they're orbiting about their common center of mass. And you see this nice, really simple wobble back and forth with the parent star. But that doesn't represent reality, right? Because even in our own solar system, there's eight planets all tugging at different times in different directions. And then the planets themselves have moons, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes very, very complex. Yes, you have to take that into consideration. So what you do is you model the signal as a, as a uh, sum of various what we call Keplerian curves with a certain predictable behavior described by certain parameters. And you have, to, you have to do that full modeling in order to tease out all of the individual components. You have the same problem when you do the transit photometry. You don't just have one little signal 
blinking, you know, periodically. You've got lots of planets, right? Potentially orbiting and transiting. And so you've got this cacophony. And you have to sort it all out. It, it just seems like the moon would be so close to the planet it's hard to differentiate. Well, okay. Uh, he's asking about moons. What kind of a gravitational influence does that impart on the Doppler measurements? But remember, it's the planet tugging on the star. It's not the moon tugging on the planet. It's the planet, that mass, collective mass, tugging on the star. So in this kind of a situation, it would be the, the mass of the Earth and the moon are going to operate as a unit in how they affect the central star. But this is exactly my point, right? So if you're saying, conferring a massive planet to determine size and so on, when it's habitable, if it has like 20 moons. Does that make a big space. difference in the case of the Earth and moon? No. Because the mass is all in the Earth. Uh, very little mass comprised in the moon. Yeah. Oh, just a minute. There was somebody over here who was waiting. Okay. Okay. If you could just wait for the microphone. Sorry. So we could all hear. <laughs> I'll get to you, I promise. So is the ultimate question that we're trying to answer is are we alone in the universe or will we when, will one day will we um, can we inhabit these planets? Will we inhabit these planets one day? Um, there are lots of scientific questions on my mind. Yes, I want to know when I look up in the sky if if, if we're alone or, or or not, right? There's something existential, something meaningful about that process of just looking up at the sky and and internalizing deeply what's there. I mean, just, just having participated in the Kepler mission, as the years flew by and we, we discovered more and more and more planets, as I started to do these calculations as to what fraction of planets, of stars harbor planets, and as the discoveries rolled in and I realized that that number was basically 100%. Every single point of light that I see up in the sky is likely to have a planet. Okay? And as that knowledge sank in, when I looked up at the sky, I began to see not points of light as stars. I started to see planetary systems when I looked up at the sky. It really changes fundamentally how you see yourself in the universe, right? So, yes, the question of are we alone is very, very important. There are other science questions that are very, very important, too. Um, I think I've lost track of what your original question was. <laughs> I'm getting too excited. But, um, we have a question over here. Did I, I feel bad. I think I totally missed her question. <laughs> Was that your question? I think she said, are we going to live there? Oh, oh, yeah, are we going to inhabit it? So what I think is that once we can look up in the sky and point to a living, to a place in the sky where there, we know that there, there is a living world, I think we're going to figure out how to get there. That's my, that's my personal opinion. Um, so when you're looking and measuring at the brightness of stars, how do you correct for the dimming due to uh, cosmic dust and debris? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. So as we're doing this, and we're trying to tease out these part per 10,000 dimmings of light, how do we take care of all the other junk? Now, I mean, he mentions dust, but I mean, stars have spots on their surface, and the stars rotate, so the spots go in and out of view, and that causes the star to, to vary. Even our own sun is varying, its light put changes magnetic activity and all that kind of stuff. Rotation plus magnetic activity causes all these variations. Um, and the saving grace is that all of those things operate on different time scales. So what that means is that algorithmically, I can write a computer program that does filtering to isolate the different time scales of interest. And then I can run my algorithm on only the time scale of interest to transit detection, which is about four to 12 hours is the time scale of interest. And stars are actually pretty quiet on that time scale. Hi. Uh, a few weeks ago, I heard from NPR on the New York Times about a team of scientists. Uh -huh. um, they decided that there's a possibility of a real nine planets of our solar system. Right. Can you share some insights into that discovery or potential of that uh, ninth planet? Before I comment on that, let me just say there are cases of systems that Kepler discovered where you've got transiting planets, right? And we have observed that the transits don't arrive 
perfectly periodically, as you would expect, right? With the orbital period, which should arrive like a cold book, right? But in some cases, it doesn't. There's a delay, or it arrives too early, right? And when we time it very precisely, we notice patterns. And those patterns tell us that there is another mass in the system, another nearby planet that's actually tugging on the planet that's transiting. And so in many of these cases, we have gone out and we've done Doppler measurements and the like, and we have confirmed, yes, indeed, there is another planet there. Okay? These are called transit timing variations. So now, there's a team of astronomers. Um, this particular team is down at Caltech. Mike Brown and his team for years have been surveying the outer solar system, or actually just surveying the sky, looking around and looking for things that whiz, that whiz by, right? Looking for debris, tiny objects, Kuiper belt objects, all of these tiny things that are in the far reaches of the, of the solar system. And they discovered objects like Sedna and Kor and Eris, many objects. In fact, this is what led to the big controversy about Pluto. All of a sudden, ne next thing you know, this guy, Mike Brown, finds an object that's bigger than Pluto. So the question becomes, well, is it now a planet too? And the problem with that argument is that there are potentially hundreds of these things out there, because there's a belt of debris called the Kuiper Belt, and, and debris beyond that. And so we think that this represents an entire new class of objects. All right? So, so that's the Kuiper Belt objects. Now, as Mike Brown and his team discovered these things over the years, and they started doing this kind of stamp collecting, right, adding these new discoveries, they started to notice a pattern. And it's represented here in this graphic. Here's a bunch of these Kuiper Belt objects. And keep in mind that the orbit of Uranus is like way in here and inside this bright yellow dot. These are all really far out in the solar system. But he, you know, what he noticed about these objects is that the peri, perihelion, the, the spot in space where they make their closest approach to the sun, they were kind of lined up. There was something systematic. How come there aren't any big loop-de-loops over here? And so, it, it became like so glaringly, such a glaring problem that they realized it could not, it's not very likely that it's due to chance. And so what they did was they started to model what kind of a mass would be required to shepherd all of these things systematically into this kind of pattern, all right? Gravitationally, just like these transit timings I told you about. Right? What kind of mass would be required? And here it is, this hypothetical planet 9. And what's, a, what's striking about this is that it's not just another tiny little Kuiper Belt object. This guy is predicted to have a mass 10 times that of the, of the Earth. Not as big as Neptune, which is about 17 times the mass of the Earth. Um, not as small as Earth, but somewhere in between. Remember that gray area? It's always kind of puzzled me. Why doesn't the solar system have one of these planets that are so pervasive out there in nature? Right? I don't know if this is the answer, but it's very, very compelling. So people have looked for other planets in the solar system. They've hypothesized that other planets exist, planet X, and etc. Um, this one is actually based on some very compelling evidence. I think this is very exciting. It would have an inclination relative to the other solar system planets of about 30 degrees. And so it's, it's very oddball. Um, but I think what you're witnessing is a more comprehensive picture of planet formation and planetary systems that's forming now, today, in these years. It's very exciting, both in the solar system and beyond. Yes. yes, my question is, uh, you mentioned in your talk that you guys picked a, like, a window to look at. Yeah. How did you pick that window? How did we choose that window? So why did we look there? And that, that place on the sky, it turns out to be between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra, which um, form the summer triangle, part of the summer triangle in the summer sky. Three very prominent stars. 
Um, well, for several reasons. One, because we wanted to observe someplace in the northern hemisphere, because that's where a lot of our ground-based telescopes are that we use for follow-up observations. So the second criteria is that we wanted a place where there were lots of stars, okay? Because we're doing transit photometry. And the probability of having a system that's lined up just right so that it casts the shadow right across your telescope is pretty small. It's like a half of a percent, right? So we need to observe lots of stars in order to find the few that are in this right geometry. So where do we have lots of stars in the sky? Near the planet of the Milky Way, right? So we wanted to observe near the plane of the Milky Way. We wanted to observe in the Northern Hemisphere. And then the final criteria, as the spacecraft is orbiting the sun, not the Earth, it orbits the sun, and, and stares, like let's say that's our patch of sky right there, and here's my spacecraft, and it's orbiting, and it has to keep that alignment so that it's sort of always is staring at that one piece of sky. Well, when the spacecraft's over here, it's looking over the sun. So we couldn't have that angle be too small, or we're going to get lots of scattered light into our telescope. So that was another constraint. Um, there, there were some others, you know, the devil's in the details. We spent actually a couple of years fine-tuning it, but those are the big, the big ones, the tall ones. So uh, I'm very excited about the new big telescope with the telegraph, but I have a feeling it's going to take more than 50 years to, uh, to get it operational, you know how it all goes. Uh, I, so I'm wondering if in the meantime we can learn anything about the atmospheres of those planets just by trying to look uh, for just the right spot during their transit as the light of the star reflects through their atmosphere, <laughs> atmosphere and glimpse something out of that. So. That's, that's brilliant, yes. Did you guys hear what he said? How about if we take these transiting planets, okay, and we observe them right when they're in front of the star. So now you've got the starlight filtering through the atmosphere and going to our telescope, right? All we have to do is subtract out the light from the star and we're good, we get what's left. That's exactly what we're going to do with TESS and JWST, which I mentioned briefly. TESS launches in 2017. That's going to find some nearby planets um, that are transiting. Uh, nearby is important because even with this methodology, you need very high precision. Um, uh, how could I drive that point home? The, the atmosphere that you're talking about is this thin, thin little haze, okay? It's like one two hundredth the area of the disk of the planet itself, right? It's very thin. So we're getting very few photons, so you need exquisite precision. Um, so TESS is going to launch to look, do a full sky survey, not just one part of the sky, but the full sky, and is going to find all the nearest transiting planets. And then the James, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, is going to do exactly what you just said. But it, we, we think it's only going to be able to do that for the kind of Neptune-sized planets in the Just that the haze is just too thin. Hi, I have a few questions. Uh, one, uh, How many does he get? Yes. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, quick one. Uh, are the planetary disks random? The second one would be uh, uh, something like Jupiter, if it was closer to the uh, uh, sun. You know, it has so many cool planets like Europa, etc. Those are potentially planetary. Is that taken into consideration? And the third? Oh, I'm not going to remember the third. Could you hold on for one second? No, you can ask it. But just okay. let me answer the first sure. two, and we'll actually have you say it all over again. I see. I already forgot what your first one was. Oh, uh, planetary disks. Are they random? Yes. Yes. When we look at giant molecular clouds that form lots of stars, the angular momentum vector, which is the spin vector of the stars, are all randomized. Therefore, their planetary orbits are probably all randomized as well. So that's the first one. The second one. Uh, 
the, the moons, the satellites of the giant planets. We have hundreds. Sure. Okay. Of, we have detected hundreds of Jupiter-sized or Neptune-larger-sized planets orbiting in the Goldilocks zone. Their moons, if they were to have them, are going to be very interesting. Uh, are those taken into consideration in the stats? Uh, no. Okay. Are they? So the question is, are they taken into consideration when we consider the average number of stars that host potentially habitable worlds? No. So that the ante. Yes, very interesting. Okay, so, go ahead, your third. Uh, that's the one that's most exciting to me, whether it's true or not. I read about a year ago that um, a sun, a star that's about six light years away now, was potentially as close as the Oort cloud and less than one light year away, about 60,000 years ago. And potentially, that's a cyclic event. I don't know. But if that was true, obviously, interstellar travel becomes far more likely. I was just wondering if I you know am not sure. I, I kind of suspect that what you're talking about is the... Um, so there, is a, there was a very uh, interesting result recently, just a couple months ago, um, that concerned the idea of planets orbiting stars in globular clusters. So, our sun is not in a globular cluster. This star was as close as the Oort cloud and possibly only. I haven't heard that that there was ever a star that was as close as the Oort cloud. Um, but but the idea, if you wonder if you know what a globular cluster is, our galaxy has lots of these globular clusters. The density of stars is very high. Those globular clusters are very old. They've been around essentially since the beginning of the galaxy, 13 billion years. And so the idea is that there could be life, maybe life is more prevalent in these globular clusters, and maybe they have colonized because the star density is so much higher. It's a very, very interesting idea. And they're looking down at the galaxy and they're saying, man, too bad there's no life there. <laughs> we have one more question. Okay. But I'm, I'm going to say thanks for a nice presentation. The second thing is that I, I have a question about uh, asteroids versus uh, planets. With that uh, Kepler's mission, uh, how do you distinguish between both of them? How do you distinguish between, between uh, asteroids, asteroids and, and the planets? Kepler is not sensitive enough to see an asteroid. Yeah. So it's it could just, be. They're too small, right? So, so it's not going to cause a dimming of light. We can see down to Mercury-sized planets, if they're orbiting very, very close to their parent stars. There are some cases of Mercury-sized planets, but we can't see anything smaller than that. So could it be possible some of the planets you're talking about we observe, it could be asteroid? No. Okay. Well, I, I mean, a big asteroid is a planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Semantics. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. Let's thank our speaker one more time. And the length of the telescopes are open, correct? Yes, they should be if it's not overcast. Even if it's overcast.